This is going to be a very mini and very brief workshop because we've only got just less than two hours. I know you guys are busy. I don't want to take up too much time. So I'm trying to give you a bit of an insight into what I think the, low, the role of a leader and a manager is in life assurance and particularly how you can play a part in reference to this morning's session to help your FCs, FSCs apply and achieve and succeed in NDRT and stuff like that. I know some of you are here this morning. I'm going to repeat some of that for the, for the, new, for the new guys as well about what we did this morning. Then we'll do this mini workshop uh, and a bit of Q&A as well if you want to do so. I've been around a long time. I've had a pretty good success in the business and hopefully you'll see as we go through together I am passionate about life assurance. That's, that's it, 100% passionate. I like agents because they are our children, and I think myself as a parent, but you guys are the parents. And uh, when I'm working with agents, FSCs, I am relatively uh, easygoing. But I tend to be a bit harder on leaders, not to make it tough for you guys, but it all comes down to you, to you and the success of your agents is in your hands, not in their hands. I was successful in life assurance, not because I was clever, not because I was talented, not because I was handsome, of course, yeah. but because I had two very good leaders, that is all. And in my 26 years in life assurance all over the world, I have seen too many potentially good agents die because of poor or ineffective leaders. So our job as leaders, as I'm sure most of you know by now, is a very, very big part of our agent's success, just like your own family at home. Children, there's no such thing as bad children. Children become good or bad depending on how their parents are. It's exactly the same with agents. Agents become successful or not depending on how their agent parents are, which is you guys. You are, you've got your family at home and you've got your family in the office. And to me, it should be exactly the same. You love your children at home, and I would hope you should love your agents in the office. Metaphorically, not literally, because we don't want to cross that line. So, let me just tell you a bit about myself first. I'll do a five minute re recap of what we did this morning with your guys, so those who are not here can be up to steam about, about the main theme of the day, and then we'll get into the workshop. But can you hear me okay? Yes. Am I going too fast, too slow? Is it okay? Yes. We're cool. I'm a bit nervous, so I might speak a bit fast. You guys are scaring me something. So, who am I? Very quickly, this is my CV. I joined Life Assurance in uh, 1984, 23rd of March. It was a Friday. The company I joined was a small company called Liberty Life Assurance. which is a small uh, unilink company, average sales force of only about 1,000 full-time agents at any one time. I did MBRT my first year, and then went on to do COT and TOT. Became an agency leader, we call them branch managers. After that, I became an offshore IFA, which is what I am today. So I still am an offshore independent financial advisor. Why did I go offshore? Just more money, that's all. I started traveling, I left the UK, I went to Malta first, small island in the Mediterranean. Then went to Dubai, South Africa, Botswana. I arrived here in Asia in 1993. I've been living in Asia for now 17 years. My base is Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my wife is Malay, so she's a bumi putra, I'm a bumi pute. It's like yin and yang, they go together. She's involved in training, she's not involved in selling, but she's involved in training. She's an LLP coach and trainer. Uh, so I've got about two and a half thousand clients around the world, personal clients. My persistency always has been and always will be 100%. I've never lost a client in my life so far. Uh, I'm still an offshore IFA, I still sell. Production last year was about COT, on average. Uh, still selling, but now because I'm a lot older, my focus is coaching. The only reason I'm doing coaching, apart from I enjoy it, is just to give back. That's all. I've had a good career over 25 years, and I think it's very important to give back and help people succeed. Business-wise, uh, production, NDRT, NDRT, COT, TOT, TOT. Something special here, 1989, SFY. You guys got SFY in AIA? You got MDRT? Got COT, TOT, convention. SFY? You got, you just don't know you've got. SFY stands for sleep for year. <laughs> I think a lot of you guys, especially your agents, are sleeping more than a year, sleeping in a coma. 
<laughs> and then woke up again, COT, and my production always after I left the UK is always around the COT, TOT wise, but different way of doing things now because it's offshore business. Most of my business is rolled around investment type business, portfolio management, but the equivalent production will be around COT and TOT. As a leader, you guys, I moved into management, unit manager first in 86. I got 10 agents, then 20 agents, two teams, and eventually became this position called a regional manager. So in the UK insurance companies, we have a position called regional manager, where you can have a number of branches underneath you. Eventually, I had five branches, uh, 30 agents per branch, big headache, my hair fell out, and I left. <laughs> so that's where all the hair went. I joined life insurance with hair, now all gone. Life insurance makes you rich and makes you bald. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order, but that's how it works. Uh, I can afford to buy hair now. I should have kept my own hair when I cut it off. So, one thing I want to show you today about one of the big differences between you guys and, and the West. I've been here a long time, as I said before, about 16, 17 years, and I've worked with a lot of insurance companies. I'm based in KL, but I travel the region. I've worked in Singapore a lot, Malaysia a lot, obviously, Indonesia a lot. I do work in China a few times, Thailand, and so on. What I see a big difference primarily, if I could put the two groups together of Asian agency leaders and Western agency leaders, is primarily, not all the time, it's not generic, but on average, Western leaders tend to do more personal production, and they continue to sell. Whereas in this part of the world, a lot of leaders, once they become leaders, tend to forget about personal production and go to more leadership role. Not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, different schools of thought, I appreciate it. I got my own version, I'll tell you that later, but that's primarily what happens. And particularly in the UK, this is what happens. If you want to be a leader in UK companies, you have to maintain personal production MDRT. Very, very rigid. If you don't do MDRT, so to be a leader, again, here in, in, in Asia, leaders are become leaders very fast. In the UK, minimum three years sales experience, minimum 300 personal clients, and minimum MDRT production before you apply to become a leader. Then you become a leader, but to maintain your leadership and your position, you have to maintain MDRT, personal sales, as well as managing your team. If you don't do personal sales MDRT, potentially they can take your agents off you, which is a bit severe. I appreciate that. Again, different style, different culture, but that's how it works in the West. So, in this morning session, just to bring you up to speed, those of you not here, we talked about this thing, Mount Everest, 29,000 feet, five miles high. Then we spoke about this, Bukit Tima Hill, 545 feet high. And my analogy for doing this was, I, said, I asked your agents two questions. If I was to say to the agents, go climb Bukit Tima Hill, and if you do that for a small prize, could you do it? So they all said, yeah, Bucky team at 500 feet, very easy to climb, no problem, for a prize. Then I said, if I was asked them to go and climb Mount Everest, and you get a really cool prize, same question, could they do it? Answer now, probably not, because it's 29,000 feet, a lot harder. And the analogy for doing this was, what's the difference? Was that a lot, down here in this part of the world, MDRT is treated as a big thing. I was having, when I was having the conversation first about this seminar today, and I was meeting with David and Peshi about doing the program today, is that I, was, I commented on the fact that when I first came to Asia and started dealing with local insurance companies all over Asia, that the culture here, again, was that MDRT is the big, 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 big deal, Mount Everest. And I was trying to tell to your agents this morning that it's not... MDRT is only Bukit Tima. Because it's all about belief. In the West, we treat MDRT as a normal thing. You do MDRT, okay, you're cool, but you're not a superstar, you're just cool. It's like bronze medal. COT and TOT, that's cool, but MDRT is like a minimum requirement. I'm not putting it down, it's still cool, it's still cool and it is important. But it's a lot of its perceptions 
A lot of the challenges you guys have, not just in AIA, all over the companies in Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia is the same, is the perception of the culture is that the MDRT is a big thing like Mount Everest, and to a lot of people, normal people, they can't climb Mount Everest because it's too high. It's too big, too high, too dangerous, and too scary. And that's why the, the, the success ratio of achieving MDRT is quite small relatively compared to Western companies because we treat MDRT as booking Tima, not as Mount Everest. Does that make sense? That's what I was trying to say this morning. So what I was saying is that if you believe it's Mount Everest, and it's a big issue, then it will become a big issue and very hard to do, and chances are you'll fail. But if they try to sw switch the perceptions of, of, of uh, MDRT and believe it's actually only Bookie Team a Hill, then it becomes easier mentally because the biggest step or the biggest barrier to MDRT is belief. It's not hard to do MDRT, it's a simple production. Very small, 103,000, it's not big. But you make it big because the culture here, and this is not, I'm not saying this is your fault, it's the culture, it's the company, it's the way things are done in Asia, NDRT is the big issue. I'm trying to say to your teams today, it's not as big as you think, it's actually quite easy. Once you know the steps and you do the right steps, it becomes a lot easier, it becomes less Everest and more Bukit Timur. And that was the message this morning. So your responsibility to your agent primarily I want to try and talk about a bit today in our mini workshop is to show or to prove to them that MDRT is actually easy. It's less Mount Everest, 29,000 feet, more Bukit Timur, 549 feet, 545 feet, a lot less. And that's what I tried to impress this morning and that's really your role as well to help them out. If you make it hard, they believe it's hard, it becomes hard, they don't do. It's just perception and belief. You make it easy, they believe it's easy, and they will got the chances of doing it a lot easier. So that was the, the idea from this morning's session. So, how do you prove to your FCs that it's easy to do? The obvious first step, do MDRT yourself. Uh, what I understand, to some of you, that might not be an option, and I appreciate that. There you go. Me, do MDRT too hard. But if you believe it's hard, they will believe it's hard. It's just a chicken and egg. Leaders should, a good leader should do what? Lead by example. Okay, come back to that later. Last question on this before we get into the workshop. If you can't do MDRT yourself, or you've never done MDRT yourself, then maybe it's a challenge for you to show other people how to do it. Again, no right and no wrong, I'm not passing judgments, I'm not trying to upset people here. But an easier, one of the easiest ways to, to motivate your agents, we'll look at motivating agents later, is to do personal sales. Number one, because you're leading by example. Number two, you're showing you how to do it. And number three, you make more money. The only reason I still sell today, I don't need to sell. I can stop work, I can stay at home and count my coconuts in my garden. <coughs> the reason I continue selling, not just the coaching, the reason I continue selling life insurance business or offshore business is for primarily one reason. I don't do it for the money. I don't need the money no more, fortunately. I've got enough. But I keep on selling and I keep on doing CLT production or more every year for one reason only. So I can teach people how to sell today. If I was teaching people how to sell in a classroom like this or a coach, coaching people selling, what I sold 10 years ago is different because the market has changed. Some of you, I can tell by your face, have been around a long time. When I joined Life Assurance, clients were really, really stupid. Because there was no Google, and they couldn't check. Now they got Google, so any bullshit you tell them, they can check if it's bullshit or not. 20 years ago, they believed the bullshit because they didn't know. Now you can't tell them that. You can't cover, co you can't sort of lie or cheat them or con convince them of different things because they can check there's so much information and clients now are a lot smarter than most of us in the business so they know things so the market has changed conditions have changed products have changed so that's why i continue to sell yes i enjoy the money but luckily i don't need the money i just do it to continue my skills so i'm able to help people produce sales today not what i did five years ago okay let's get on to the workshop
You're all putting to teams, which is cool. My apologies for moving you around a bit that way, but I was trying to avoid you sitting in with friends so then workshop, workshop becomes a bit more open-minded. Okay, done that, done that. Can you nominate a uh, secretary in your team? Somebody who can write. <laughs> Somebody who can write nicely. Just one person we have to write because we're going to put on the margin on paper here. Cool. They lead them into teams. I'll let you do it democratically and non-violently. Okay, what do I want you to do? First of all, shh, shh, to start the workshop off, I want you, as a team, I'll give you three minutes, five minutes, give me your definition of management as a team. You can do it in bullet form, point form, mission statement, I don't care. Whatever you like, just what's your team definition of what you think life assurance management is, if you could describe it in a few sentences or words. Hello, everyone. Shh. Okay, we define management by delegation, meaning, by example, teamwork, collaboration, and management Cool. Then after that, we have to come up with a set of definition for leadership in which we, we believe that um, leadership, we need to have vision, we need to begin with an end in mind, and we have to motivate, provide direction for the people that we are leading, and as well as leading by example. And we also believe that a leader needs to be creative, that is we think out of the box. We are also able to influence other people as well as be initiative. And the difference between Leadership and management. Um, there's a quote that we have uh, come up with. Every organization has management, but not all management has leadership. Okay, and um, the major part for management and leadership. For management, we believe that managers set up systems and they manage people. For leadership, we believe that leadership leads people through uh, to have results. So that's the. Thank you. Good. Team two. Who's team two? Team two, where's team two? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, management is about effective allocation of resources, achieving goals through others, a uh, form of delegation. It's about inculcating the right sales values. Discover the potential in others as well as leading the team towards a common goal. Okay, cool. For leadership, we have um, first of all is ownership over responsibility. Okay. Taking new grounds, grooming people to influence, setting higher standards and to gain trust. Cool. Right. The difference between leadership and management is that leadership is setting a vision or direction to a group for them to follow. Management is control order. Or direct the people in a group according to the principles that has been established. Cool. Yeah. And so I believe that leadership is more than just good management. Yeah. So, that's so do I. Have. Thank you. Are you guys in group then? Oh. Start, let me just say, on your list, managers and leaders also have to be good volunteers at public speaking. Yeah. Very important. Why so shy, Are you like agents? You should be jumping at the chance to speak in public. Where are you going? Hiding around the corner. <laughs> okay, for us, definition for management um, is ability to manage, direct, and plan. It's a super, uh, supervisory role and monitoring role. And then it usually uh, to gather the people to achieve um, moving towards a common goal. Cool. Yeah. So for leadership, usually we, uh, leadership is more about leading by example. People who are passionate and the Bring people to a higher level, ability to direct, motivate, coach, mentor, and to develop leaders. Cool. And then ability 
to accept responsibility, to have vision, courage to overcome a adversity, good decision maker, and committed. Cool. And the difference between management and leadership. Ma management usually talk, no action. Leadership talk, no action. So management is to manage, leadership is about leading. And then management is usually administrative, where else uh, leadership is always driven by activities. And uh, it's talking about the difference between decisions and goals and responsibility. Then, uh, yeah, leadership is about influence. Cool, thank you. Hey, at least in team three now, we're getting more truth and less bullshit. <laughs> Better. We're not going to go through them all, we haven't got time, we'll be here all day. You've all been through the same management training because you're all for the same company. You're all speaking basically similar.